really the point where I thought, yeah, this this is something that's going to last is when I went to visit Fardo in the Netherlands for the first time and he came and picked me up from the train station and then I felt, wow, okay, this, uh, this is something serious. That's Bayot. He and Fardo got married in the Netherlands five years ago. But their marriage isn't recognized in Switzerland. Instead, they have what's called a registered partnership, which is the legal option that's offered to same-sex couples. But their civil status is about to change. Swiss voters have just approved same-sex marriage, with almost two-thirds saying yes. I'm Susan Masika, and this is The Swiss Connection. As the vote results came in, I was at a public viewing in Bern. It was hosted by Operation Libero, a group that helped campaign for a yes vote on the Marriage for All referendum. The atmosphere was jubilant. There was even a rainbow wedding cake. I was chatting with some people about why the yes vote was so important to them, like Alain and Laurent. I saw the other countries like France and Germany accepting this law and I was sure that one day Switzerland will do the exactly same step. We wanted to wait for the final result. Then you can start planning a wedding. We didn't want to put the cart before the horse. Then there are Mara and Natalie, who've been together for about a year. They're not ready to tie the knot, but they posed in wedding gowns for the Yes campaign. I think it's something for the future to consider. Um, In this case, for us, it was mostly important that it was possible um, because in many ways, Switzerland is still very much behind in progressive politics. Um, And it is noticeable also when we walk around in the street holding hands, you still get some rather dirty looks. As it was a really clear yes now, even if people will still look at us weird, it is... I I guess I, at least for myself, can look at them with more confidence. Over a third of voters were against marriage for all. They argued that marriage, along with the right to adopt children or to make use of sperm donations, was only meant for heterosexual couples. Some of my colleagues talked with politicians who campaigned for a no vote. One of them was Marie Bertrand Douay from the French-speaking women's section of the Swiss People's Party the most conservative of Switzerland's main parties. In the first phase, we will probably observe how children born of medically-assisted procreation to same-sex female couples will develop if their interests are respected. In a second phase, we will also fight against surrogate motherhood. Verena Herzog, a national representative of the Swiss People's Party, expressed concern that in the future same-sex couples could get additional options for starting families. On the one hand, with the expansion of reproductive medicine, not only a small door, but a garage door has been opened. Homosexual men will also want to be able to benefit from reproductive medicine. The No Committee says it doesn't intend to give up. This is what Daniel Frischknecht, president of the small right-wing Swiss Federal Democratic Union, told us. The committee will not dissolve, and we will fight against this trend, against these things. But, of course, it will be even more difficult after the floodgates have been opened. For the moment, the focus is on how this will change the lives of same-sex couples. This is why I visited Fardo and Bayat, who you heard at the top of the show, to understand what it means to them. They live in a suburb of Bern. Hello. Hello, Susan. Yes. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Nice to see you. I'll take my shoes off. How are you doing? Yeah, great. Great. I'll quickly finish feeding the cat. Okay. Well, that's important. <laughs> their apartment opens onto a patio, perfect for their teenage cat. Bayot is Swiss. He's the senior energy policy advisor at the Swiss Federal Office of Energy. Fardo, a high school biology teacher, is Dutch. He first came to Switzerland in 2008 to work on a master's project. He'd only been in town for a few days when... A friend or someone who I had met just then that week there at that um, 
at the University of Bern then invited me for a dinner at her place and then afterwards her um, WG mitbewoner, her flatmate, <laughs> flatmate um, invited me over still to a bar because he was going there to meet some friends and one of these friends was bailed here. Is this how you remember it? Yeah, so it was Fardo's first weekend basically or second weekend I think in Switzerland and um, that's how we met, yeah. <laughs> And what was your first impression? Um, wow, an interesting guy. From that first meeting at the bar to deciding, oh, there, there could be something here, how long did that take? That basically happened when Fardo had to go back to the Netherlands and the question was, will the relationship continue or not? And for me... Um, Really the point where I thought, yeah, this this is something that's going to last is when I went to visit Fardo in the Netherlands for the first time and he came and picked me up from the train station and then I felt, wow, okay, this, uh, this is something serious. They did the long distance thing. They spent a summer together in Amsterdam. And then they lived apart again, actually trading countries because each man had found a career opportunity in the other one's country. Finally, they ended up back in the city where they met, Bern. But when they were ready to commit, Bayot and Fardo couldn't get married in the Swiss capital. They were telling me about their experience at the registry office. Then they're also not allowed to say, oh, have like happy ceremony, happy marriage. They said, ah, habt eine gute Eintragung. Like, oh, have a good registration. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. It's very romantic, very romantic. <laughs> so you took his name. Yep. And why was that? Well, because we were always thinking of maybe also some time having children. And I thought, well, if we then have a mom and two dads and three family names, it'll be too complicated. So we'll just keep it at two family names. And why his name and not your name? Because all this should actually be Fardo saying it, but um, because it sounds nicer. (laughs) (laughs) I would just say because um, he looked very, like, um, cute and blinked with his eyes when he asked me. (laughs) So I couldn't say no. (laughs) Ah, so you proposed. I proposed, yes. Ah, well, so he proposed, proposed, but he also proposed to take my name, to take his name. No? Or to have one name. I'm not sure exactly how that discussion went. But I proposed... uh, to get married in a restaurant du Nord in Bern, where we actually also met for the first time. Oh, yeah. I didn't want to propose with a ring because that's just a bit too cheesy and standard. And I was discussing with a friend, like, what could I propose with? It should be something practical as well. And sort of just spontaneously, she said, well, why not socks? Everybody needs socks. <laughs> So what I've actually done is uh, had a pair of socks made. On one sock it said, will you? And on the other sock, marry me. And then I had brought that to the restaurant beforehand, nicely packed, and uh, told them to bring it uh, instead of the food to first bring those socks. And what did you think of that? Well, sort of the idea of marrying was totally was not weird or something. We were always sort of in a light. Yeah, whenever we get married, then we'll do that and that or something. So... But it had totally caught me off guard. Now both men are wearing matching stainless steel rings that they exchanged on August 10th, 2016. I mean, we we had the advantage that we could go to the Netherlands to get married. (laughs) And it was anyway fun. We could finally have sort of intermingling of people from the Netherlands to Switzerland meeting each other, which is always nice. (laughs) That's the thing, the joy of a wedding, all the people getting together on a happy day. Which was... Also, one of the main reasons, I think, to get married. Also, just to um, to, yeah, to celebrate our love, basically. Because from a legal point of view, there wasn't really any reason to get married, except that probably we pay a bit more taxes. <laughs> no, that's not true. So there's one thing which we haven't discussed yet, which is for me, was for me the most concrete difference between marriage and registered partnership, is that um, to get naturalized as a Swiss person... When you're married, it's much easier. If you would get married, it doesn't matter where you live. You can move as much as you want. And, you know, you only have to go once to the federal state and it's done. So that was for me really the the critical difference. So I guess now you're going to have to get married again here in Switzerland. 
Yeah, there's definitely an expectation from a lot of our friends that there will be another party. <laughs> and also for Fardo to get Swiss citizenship, uh, it's definitely a reason to really get married in Switzerland and not just have this registered partnership. Whether or not they have a formal wedding ceremony in Switzerland, when the new law takes effect, most likely in July 2022, Fardo and Bayot can convert their registered partnership into a marriage. So then they won't just be partners, they'll be husbands. And as Fardo is saying, that'll make them eligible for facilitated naturalization. As a married couple, they'll also be allowed to adopt children together. At the same time, married lesbian couples will have access to sperm donations, which is also something new. Bayot and Fardo were telling me more about their family planning. We've anyway been looking into starting a family already for a while. The model that uh, we prefer is actually a co-parenting with two dads and one or two moms. And for that, the new law doesn't change anything because um, that's anyway, in principle, of course, just allowed because you can have children. But for the rights for the children, there's still a ways to go because officially a child can only have two parents um, yeah, now be it two moms or two dads or a mom and a dad, but three or four parents uh, is not possible yet legally. And why do you think people are against that? Well, I think maybe just because it's also new and it's not um, doesn't fit this very traditional image that still a lot of people have of a family with mom and dad and two children usually, maybe a boy and a girl, and a car and a house, and a dog and a cat. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I think also with, like, if you go into the co-parenting, and, because that's the same discussion they also have in the Netherlands right now, one thing is also really the, the talk about legal aspects, that you, you know, you, then you have four sort of responsibles. I guess it's also something just to get used to, I mean... A lot of children are also raised by their grandparents and stuff like that. So you sort of the, the idea of having more people that are responsible for a child's upbringing is not something new at all. Yeah, so others could make the argument that the more people helping, the better. This whole in taking a village to raise a child. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, it's exactly that. Yeah. Yeah, we have friends who uh, have sort of this co-parenting model, and that was exactly the line they had on the birth card, you know, because they were also three, two dads and one mom, and they had also a, it takes a village to raise a child. Maybe one thing we haven't talked about, which I yeah still find quite interesting, is that Switzerland is actually quite slow in these things, because if you look at uh, Western Europe, it's basically every country from Portugal to Finland has... Uh, marriage for everybody already for quite a while and it's only Italy and Switzerland um, who didn't so um, and I just found that interesting because Switzerland isn't internationally I think seen as a very conservative country but in these things it lags behind sometimes and why do you think it was lagging behind I don't notice anything about sort of discrimination sort of just in daily life on the street. Like cities are very progressive. Maybe, you know, we only go to the countryside to go hiking. I mean, I remember once when we wanted to have a room in Wallace and I had already reserved it beforehand because I was already there. And then she warned me that it was like a, a single two-person bed and it was in French. And, um, but I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And she, and she said, yeah, but it's one bed, you know, one bed for two people. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And she just couldn't, she couldn't fathom that we would want to share a bed together. <laughs> and it was sort of <laughs> interesting. Yeah, and I think Switzerland just is traditionalist in some ways. I mean, if you look at the women's voting rights, that also took a very, very long time. And in the last canton, only in 1991. Uh, so, yeah, just takes time, I guess. And would you agree that you haven't experienced much discrimination? You can walk, can you walk down the street holding hands here in Bern? Yeah, yeah, that's no problem. Maybe, I don't know how it would be in the middle of the night when youth is partying. And I could imagine that there you get some, yeah, comments. Uh, but, yeah, we We're usually not. don't go partying in the middle of the night. <laughs> it doesn't happen. I mean, one thing where we lived in Amsterdam, it was a neighborhood with uh, lots of Muslim uh, 
immigrants and also a lot of youth on the street, groups of young men. And there I did not feel comfortable walking hand in hand with Fardo. But here in Switzerland, I don't think there's ever been a situation where I didn't feel comfortable. Oh, the, the the bad thing is, of course, you also sometimes it's sort of part of your instinct now that you sometimes know when to hold hands or not, and so you don't really think about it anymore. It's sort of an automate automatism. So I don't remember any conscious decision of not holding hands, but I bet that in some situations you sort of you know don't do it because you, because you realize it might be a risk. But of course, on the other hand, that's also stereotyping us other people. You know, I was. This vote, with 64.1% of the voters agreeing that same-sex marriage should be legal, what's the big takeaway for you? What, what does it really mean for you? For me, maybe the most important uh, thing is that uh, progress uh, is possible and, uh, and can be made. I mean, this is already a big step from the registered partnership that we've had so far. And it also means that in hopefully uh, five or ten more years, we can also convince those 36% who said no, that love is love. And it doesn't matter if it's uh, heterosexual or homosexual or bisexual. It's just uh, two people who want to care for each other. I think for me, I got today also a message from a friend congratulating me, a Swiss friend, congratulating me on the, the result. And I said, well, you know, I also congratulated him back. So, you know, he's not in a gay relationship or anything. But I think it's just for everybody sort of such an evident thing that all people should have the same rights. I mean, for me, that was quite a fundamental thing. And for me, that is just really nice that exactly that we can sort of see us also as people. <laughs> And it was Bayout who proposed the first time around with socks. So Fardo is now at your turn, perhaps with gloves or mittens. <laughs> <laughs> mittens would fit, because <laughs> Bayout is the person who's more often cold than I am. Yeah, I mean, I would anyway propose to have another party here in Switzerland, to have the symmetry going on. The Swiss Connection is a Swiss Info production. We report regularly on Swiss politics and direct democracy, so be sure to visit us at swissinfo.ch for more on this and other issues. Earlier on, you might have heard that women in Switzerland didn't get the vote until 50 years ago. You can learn more about that in our episode, Why Women's Suffrage Took So Long, which is from March 2021. And you can find all of our episodes wherever you get your podcasts. So go ahead and subscribe to be sure you don't miss out. Have you got a comment or a question for us? You can send us an email at swissconnection at swissinfo.ch. We love hearing from you. This episode was reported and produced by me, Susan Masika. Additional reporting by Celine Stegmuller and Pauline Turuban. Our sound engineer is Donnie Wheeler. And the theme music you're hearing now was composed by Michele Andina. Thanks for listening. Do you want to polish your knowledge about Swiss elections, referendums and political parties while at the same time learning more about the quirks of the political system in Switzerland? If that's the case, our newsletter course is just what you need. Each week for a month, we'll send you a free instalment explaining the most important details of how Swiss democracy works. Our course teaches you who's eligible to vote in Switzerland, what the different parties stand for, how election and popular vote results are implemented, and what distinguishes Swiss democracy from other political systems. Our crash course is interactive, like democracy itself. Your questions will be answered on an FAQ page, and you can debate with other users and share your inputs and opinions. 
We will also provide links to multimedia articles and videos to help you better understand the Swiss democratic system. Please join us and sign up for the free Democracy Crash Course newsletter at www.swissinfo.ch slash democracy. That's www.swissinfo.ch slash democracy.